everyone welcome to this dyeing vlog i am super excited to dye some yarns with the new scapius naked yarns and with the jacquard dyes if you haven't seen my unboxing video i will link that somewhere uh, because i go over all of the different yarn bases there are six different yarn bases all in different fiber content and yarn weights this is the alpaca blend for example i am starting with some fingering weight yarns in the sock yarn base and the pure wool base uh, you will see that this one has some brown cotton on it i've marked the undyed skeins with that same cotton so i know that these are from this base and that the other one um, will not have that brown cotton on it. So I've wound the pure wool into five mini skeins. I did that with my spinning wheel over there. It has this kind of windmill yarn winder on top. I used two of the pegs and 50 reps to make a mini skein and then the rest I left in one big skein so that is 50 grams. I made it into mini skeins so that I will have more skeins to experiment with because there is some some mixed information online about how much citric acid you would add to your dye pot whether that's 1%, 2%, 5% or even 25%. I found all of it. <laughs> all of these instructions so i'm going to have a little go and i want to do that with the same color because otherwise how can you tell the the idea is that if you add more citric acid that you will have a stronger color because it kind of acts as a bind as a glue between the yarn and the dye technically it will also bind to the yarn without any citric acid but it will bind more if you use citric acid and the more you use the stronger it gets of course up to a point because it also depends on how much dye powder you put in you can just use these cotton loops around your yarn i also use tie wraps uh, these are reusable uh, i don't recommend using single-use tie wraps because that is not sustainable at all for yarn dyeing uh, if you want uh, to have a single-use item just use a piece of fabric like this that will do just fine it's just a bigger loop that you can use to scoop the yarn out with and that you uh, can use to to untangle the yarn if it's if it gets tangled Right, so I have all these mini skeins. I will be winding this one into mini skeins as well. I have my dye. Um, so the Scapius Naked yarn, you can get it from any Scapius stockist. Of course, it depends on if they have the yarn in their store or not, but even if they don't, they are able to order it for you. So if you want to do some yarn dyeing, um, then you can always ask your uh, local Scapius stockist. Uh, just be aware that they have to order it in, I think, five skein or 10 skein quantities. So if you're able to buy that much, then the stock doesn't have to rely on other people also wanting that product. Just in case you can't find it anywhere near you, um, that's a tip for you. And your Scapius stockers will also be able to get the Jacquard dyes from the very same supplier that they uh, get the Scapius yarns from. And you can get them in little jars like this or... Um, in a set, I've already taken things out, but uh, it comes with the three primary colors plus black. It comes with a bag of citric acid and with a color wheel and some recipes on the back. I also have some pre-mixed dyes. This is crocodile green. This is lilac. I also have some others. So I'm very, very excited to jump into this. Before I go on to share my ideas, my experiment recipes i want to share what other materials you will need first of which very important is a dusk dusk <laughs> dust mask 
So not your, I'm holding it upside down. This goes over the nose. <laughs> This is a heavy duty dust mask. This is uh, for asbestos. <laughs> I um, um, my uh, my partner uh, has some access to these at his work. So tip for uh, if anyone knows someone who works <laughs> in uh, construction or in a adjacent branch, uh, you can get these. Uh, so uh, the the regular dust masks. Um, they're, they're usually sold in hardware stores or wherever you can buy wood and drills and, you know, wallpaper, paint, that kind of store. Uh, they will have the dust masks. Um, those COVID mouth masks, mouth, uh, uh, face masks, I don't think they will be effective enough, but... If you would otherwise use nothing, then I'd rather you use uh, a face mask like that, but really take the time to just get a dust mask. Um, they're not uh, single use, so you can use them whenever you die yarn. And then you will need some scales if you want your yarn recipes to be repeatable. So if you dye a skein of yarn and you think, hey, this one looks cool, I want to dye exactly the same one, you will need a kitchen scale. Similarly, you will need some measuring spoons or any old spoon that you will put into your recipe. Like this is the spoon I used and I used this much. Um, then what I have is a general purpose tarpaulin because I want to have something to cover the floor. I'm not sure if this will do the trick. I will have to check. I need something to cover the kitchen surface. I bought some cling film and I also, uh, I got some wrapping paper because it was super cheap. Um, it was on sale. So this was cheaper than those items. Well, this one was two for two pounds. So maybe this one was cheaper anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is just because uh, this is dye powder. You don't want this to, to go anywhere, uh, not in your respiratory si system, but also not uh, onto your floor, in the grout of the tiles. Uh, I live in a rented space. I don't want my landlord to, uh, to be angry about blue grout specks. <laughs> and what I also advise to make this as mess free as possible is that you have some glass jars because then you can get the dye straight from the jar into a glass jar filled with water and then you mix it so that you know liquids is is not as easy to spill famous last words as dye powder because dye powder you know can is airborne <laughs> can be airborne right I think I have everything that I need uh, now let's go over the recipes right I have my little recipe book that I also used for when I was natural dyeing and what I really loved is to put some samples of the yarn in there um, these are mainly just the ties that I wound around the yarn. So, uh, so I am planning to add some extra ties around there um, just so I can snip that off and stick it in the notebook because, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> I have looked up how to actually use these dies. Uh, you can use it, uh, you can dissolve it in water and make kind of a soup stock <laughs> they actually do call it stock solution and then add that to your dye bath or you can um, have your yarn wet and then in a kind of like a low dish so you can sprinkle it on there and create speckles i'm gonna wait a little bit to do that because i think i want to do that outside just to be safe so let's take a look at the recipes. The basic process is to add citric acid to your tap water, stir it to dissolve. You might need to heat it up uh, to, in order for it to um, 
dissolve completely. Uh, heat it up to just below boiling, um, add your dye, then add your yarn. And let's take a look at the citric acid first. Um, I did a little Google search for how much to add because I looked on the Jaca website. Yeah, they just say a tablespoon per this many cups of water. And I, I don't like that system. <laughs> I want to have percentages. So I did a little Google search and I found one source uh, claiming that for a light color, you need 1% citric acid per weight of fiber. So that means if you have 100 grams of yarn that you would add one gram of citric acid. Um, for a medium vibrancy strength, uh, you would add 1.5%. And for a strong color, you would add 2%. So that would be just two grams for 100 grams of wool. Now, uh, on the Fiber Garden website, uh, they recommend five to eight percent weight of fiber. So that would be five to eight grams of citric acid for 100 grams of wool. Then <laughs> I found you and ply and they mention 25% of citric acid for yarn dyeing. Um, so I want to dye this with, let, let's just say 2%. I, I'm not sure if I can get one gram. So let's just say 2%. Um, Uh, the second one, five to eight percent. Yeah, let's do eight and then 25. <laughs> so yeah, I do want to try that. And then with the same amount of dye powder. And then I will base all of my next experiments off of that. Um, I really hope that it's not going to be the 25% citric acid because then I'll need lots more. <laughs> But yes, I want to have a go at dip dyeing. I want to have a go at uh, low immersion dyeing, which is where you let your fiber sit into the the kettle. Um, you also need <laughs> a dye pot. I did not uh, mention that. You need uh, either a stainless steel or an aluminum dye pot. So low immersion is when the, the yarn is just about covered with water and then you can add <clears throat> your dye stock to the areas that will only affect part of your skein. Um, and then you can add a different dye solution into a different part and then you can get some really nice results. Um, I've also seen indie dyers that put a knot into their yarns um, you can do you can do multiple knots as well, uh, so that the dye doesn't come in in that part of the skein. So what you can do is dye it a really light color first, then take it out, knot it, and then put it in another dye bath. Uh, I want to try that as well, and then uh, some speckling and yeah. I'm just going to have a lot of fun. And I don't know if I've mentioned this, but it's very important that anything that comes into contact with these dyes um, is something that you do not use for preparing food or for eating food afterwards. So this pot is only a dye pot. Um, you're stirring utensils only for dyeing. Uh, your measuring cups, the glass jars, only for dyeing. Um, yeah, very important. So, with all of that out of the way, let's dye some yarn! Right, so I've set everything up. Uh, I am standing on the tarpaulin that is smaller than I thought it would be. <laughs> I have my yarns, I have the dye pot. I have the citric acid, a notebook to note down my recipes, the dye powder, glass jar, tie wraps, 
my mass kitchen scale and a spoon so <laughs> i'm going to try the citric acid two percent first then eight percent then 25 percent so what's difficult about my kitchen scale is that it only does it's only accurate accurate to one gram i did one tablespoon no sorry teaspoon i did one of these uh, and i scraped off the top so it was not heaped and it said three grams uh, but then I did another one and it says eight grams. So the one teaspoon is closer to four grams than it is to three grams. So <laughs> just trying to base it off of that. So if one teaspoon is four grams, then my quarter teaspoon must be one gram even though if I only put one of these in there it says zero so it, it's probably one gram this one <laughs> not very scientific but it's the best I can do so with that uh, I can ac more accurately um, determine how much citric acid to actually put in my dye pot so for my first experiment, I'm going to do 2% citric acid. I had to use a bigger skein for that. Um, I've measured it. It's 63 grams and 2% of that is 1.26 grams. And that is the amount of citric acid that I've just added to my layer of tap water there. I've not added too much water uh, because I also am adding in water if I put in my dye stock, which I will mix in here. Um, and I can always add more water. So, yes, <laughs> this skein is going in there. I'm going to heat it up first and then, um, yeah, add the dye. <laughs> I'm wearing the mask now. <laughs> So you'll hear me muffled from now on. <laughs> I'm going to add my dye powder. This is 200 milliliters of water. And since I can't really measure accurately in grams, I'm going to do what I didn't like to do in the beginning, which is go off this spoon measurement. So I'm going to add one of this tiniest spoon of dye powder to 200 milliliters because then I can make sure it's accurate for future dye baths as well because then I don't have to weigh it. Okay, I'm thinking that one spoon for 200 milliliters is probably too much. Um, this is now, by the way, this is safe to just store. You don't have to use it right away. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to try another mixture. I have 200 milliliters of water in here. Um, and I'm going to make a lighter mixture because otherwise I have to use the same one scoop for each of the uh, minis that I do and I think that's simply too much. Oh, this one already came with the thing off, okay. But now, how am I going to do this? I'm gonna simply gonna do half a scoop. I should do... No, if I want to make it half, I need to do 400 ml of water with one scoop. Yeah. That's more accurate than, ha than trying to guess half a scoop, is to just do 400 milliliter. The only thing I do need to do is that I need to measure that I only put 200 mil in there. Ooh, look at that. Look at that. In my lovely mayonnaise jar. I 
I only need 200 ml of that, and that is almost a full cup of this. So I just hope I'm not going to spill. There. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to add the, um, the dye to the water here because for because if you add the dye first you'll get a more solid color if you add the yarn first uh, and then the dye you'll get a more um, variegated color um, the yarn has been soaked and has also been squeezed so that it's just you know it's just wet and now i'm going to plunk it in <laughs> just so that you know you really want to be careful that you don't put it in very slowly because then it might attach to that part very quickly. <laughs> okay, I would probably add some more water just to get an even tone here. Okay, I turned the heat on. And now it is a matter of getting it to just under the boiling point. You want it to be at 80 or 90 degrees. And at that point, you don't want to mess with the yarn too much because heat and friction causes felting. Uh, so yeah, we'll just see how this goes. All right, it is just below boiling now. I've turned the heat down a little bit. And if I tip it, you see that the water is almost clear. And ideally, you want to use the dye bath until the water runs clear. You can always put in another skein to absorb more. Um, and I think that adding in more citric acid would help would help as well with the absorption. With natural dyeing, you want it to be at a high temperature for about an hour. Um, I think with acid dye it's 30 minutes, but uh, I'll look it up to be sure. So the water was almost clear, so I put it back into the bucket still with all of the dye water so that it can just cool off in here. Now I am going to think of my next experiment because I kind of don't really know what to do because this green skein that I've just dyed is 63 grams and if I want to do the same, like if I want to do a comparison between amounts of citric acid, I think if I, you know, use more citric acid and then if I use the same amount of dye so also 200 milliliters but I have so much less yarn for it to attach to I think it's going to be stronger anyway so I'll have to wind another skein of approximately 60 grams and I don't have that right now so <laughs> I might just do a different I might just do a different dye bath right now and um, and see. <laughs> For uh, my next skein that I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try a full skein of this and I'm gonna dye that with the mixture that I dyed before or that I mixed before. Uh, some purple and some Kelly green. I'm very curious about this one because it says Kelly green but it's the powder is yellow. So, I'm just going to do a little bit of this. Let's see, adding, let's see if 100 ml fits in here. Oh. <laughs> okay, almost 100 ml. Yeah, okay, that is 100 ml. And then some Kelly Green. Let's look at that. Oh, 
Wow. Okay, a little more. Let's make that 200 mil. And right now I'm doing the 8% uh, citric acid, which for 100 grams means 8 grams, and that is 2 teaspoons. And now with this skein, it isn't fully submerged yet, but um, I do have more water to add when I add the dyes. So I think it will get fully submerged, but what I'm trying to do is to only dye parts of the skein. <laughs> so I'll see how that goes. I think I'm gonna add the Kelly Green first. And I'm just going to add it in a couple of places. Then I'll add lilac. It's very scientific. Oops. <laughs> okay. I can always add more. I can't take out. And this is purple. Oof. And because these are almost complementary colors, I think it will also create some browns. I'll add some more lilac, I think. All right, I've used all of the dye stock, and now you can really see the difference between the colors because this this was purple, some more uh, reddish purple. This is a more bluish purple, and this green is very vibrant, much more vibrant than the uh, cal um, crocodile green. And now the trick is to not touch it. <laughs> Okay, for my third experiment, I want to mix a brown. What I've got here is a bit of gold ochre, a bit of turquoise, and a bit of fuchsia. So let's see what we get. Okay, looking very green, but yeah, it's looking very green, and you can test the color on some paper. See, so that's a very yellowish green, so to get brown, what do we add? We want to add more of the fuchsia. I was being very sparingly with the fuchsia because, yeah, <laughs> uh, it says here to get orange, one part hot fuchsia to 39 parts sun yellow. So that's why I was out. That's why I was a little bit hesitant about putting that in. We'll try with a bit more fuchsia. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, we have an olive green. That's also cool. Okay, this looks more brown. So let's see. Okay, we definitely got a brown. Looks cool. All right, it's time for the results of the yarn dyeing, at least for the first couple of skeins. Uh, I am playing another dye session, but I wanted to 
create multiple videos because otherwise it gets too long. So the very first one, uh, which was 60 grams, um, dyed with the crocodile green with uh, 200 milliliters of that, turned out like this. And it's always tricky to get the color right on camera. Uh, I do think it is showing up slightly muted on camera. I think it is very <laughs> vibrant. I'm not sure if it will show up properly. <laughs> this is more like the color, even though I am now completely <laughs> blown out. But uh, yeah, it is more like this. Um, but I'll tone it down. <laughs> Oops. There we go. Um, yeah, that's closer. I'm trying to think of anything you would get in the supermarket that would be this f <laughs> this flavor, uh, this uh, this color. It's um, let's see. It it reminds me of like uh, green parrots or parakeets uh, it's very vibrant um, and I want to experiment a little bit with dulling this down because this is not a color that I would use because it's just too bright uh, it is really like uh, a vibrant green that you would use as part of a rainbow um, and to dull a color down, you need to use the opposite color on the color wheel, which is called the complementary color. So I could add a little bit of red to this. Uh, I could also add a little bit of black to just get it a darker green, but I'm not sure if it would work if I would just plonk this in black dye or if I would uh, mix dark green dye with the black and then crocodile green color. So. Uh, yeah, I've got some experimenting to do, but it is it is a nice result. Um, I uh, I dyed this in the pot with uh, enough water in it to swish it around, uh, so the color is nice and even. Of course, there is some variation here and there, but that is often just really really nice. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It is, it is very even, although in some places it is a more cooler green and in some places it's a more warmer green. I think you can see that it's a slightly cooler green here and uh, here it's more yellow green. Um, yeah, it is very nice. Uh, so experiment is definitely uh, succeeded. I just... Uh, want to experiment more. Uh, so the second one that I did was with the two shades of purple and then the Kelly green and the Kelly green is very vibrant. Um, I'm going to untwist this as well and very noticeably uh, the cotton or I think this is cotton at least, might be something else. Uh, the the yarn ties are not dyed at all. They, de they did not take the dye, which is very interesting. It's worth noting that with uh, dylon or with rich dyes, they would adhere to the cotton more than to wool. And with jacquard dyes, they adhere to the wool more. Uh, so that's really interesting. So we can see that this green is very, very vibrant. It is a kind of highlighter green. Uh, again, it's not showing up as bright on camera, but that, you know, <laughs> bright shades are notorious for not showing up well. I think you can see a little bit of difference between the two. It is very noticeable in person. So what I did for this one was, uh, I th this is a 100 gram skein of the pure wool. I think it, it's a sport weight one. And I I put it in the dye pot and I did not touch the yarn after putting it in, which means that where I put the color, it really only stayed there. And there is even some white spots where where there's no dye at all. And I think if I would have swirled the dye bath just a little bit 
after putting the colors in, I think it would have allowed the dye to seep in more. And also for this, I'm going to over dye it as well, simply because these colors are not really my thing. And yeah, I think it's <laughs> just fun to experiment because remember in the video when I said, oh, there's probably gonna be some overlapping between the purple and the green, and that's probably going to cause some brown color. When you, when you mix colors, and in the colors, you have all three primaries, which is here as well. In purple, you have red and blue, and in green, you have blue and yellow. Uh, when you mix colors like that, you get um, either a brown or a gray. If it leans more cool, then you get more gray. If it leans more warm, then you get brown. And these colors lean more cool, which is why I got gray in some places. So here it really shows up gray here even though if you look close by you can see it is green overlap with purple but if if you look at it from far away it just looks some kind of gray uh, so that's really interesting. I want to see what happens if I really over dye this with red uh, or yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I'll do blue. Maybe I'll lean into the cool and uh, over dye this with blue. I don't know. We'll experiment. Um, so that was also a success. Then the third one, I wanted to create a brown and it worked. It worked. But something really interesting happened with this. So this is uh, the DK Alpaca. I don't think that affected the how it took the dye but I still want to add it and I mixed yellow fuchsia and turquoise for this if you would mix those paint colors you would get a deep brown but I have to remember that I'm adding that color onto pure white yarn so of course it's going to be very light and I do have a jar of uh, black dye powder so I think if I want to get if I want to create the brown that I have in mind that I need to add some black but still it is a very nice color again I'm not sure if it uh, shows up on camera but some spots are really green um, can you see that here it's more like uh, a yellowy brown and other spots are more salmony brown uh, so it's where the fuchsia kind of seeps in and it was really interesting because when I when I put it in the dye bath it absorbed the turquoise and yellow first and it left the fuchsia most of it left it in the dye bath so in the water it just looked brown and then when I lifted it out of the water in order to place it down differently you know in order to swish it a little bit when I took out the skein it looked green and that was so interesting and but I did I did just leave it in there longer so it absorbed a little bit more of the fuchsia and I think that's why that color kind of lays on top of it you get a more red feel of this skein but it's really interesting because in the first couple minutes of the dye bath it seemed to not absorb the fuchsia at all and even after a half an hour when uh, basically it has absorbed all of the dye that it can there was still a lot of fuchsia left in the water the water was still uh, very pink so what I did was I put in another skein beside it so these are from the very same dye bath but this was put in earlier and it absorbed all of the turquoise and yellow and it left some of the fuchsia which is then absorbed by this one and this resulted in a lovely candy candy floss candy cotton pink and yeah it's lovely so <laughs> that was really interesting and i've, I've heard of um, color breakage like this before so yeah i i don't know if i can change that in some way because for this dye pot I did mix in more fuchsia to the dye powder 
after I already added water. So I think, I'm not sure if, if it would have been avoided if I mixed all of the dry powders before. Again, we'll have to experiment some more, but for now, I, I really like this, this skein of yarn. I do want to do some more experimenting wi uh, with how I can create a more, like a darker brown, a deeper brown, and yeah. And this green, <laughs> still, I'm looking at the screen, it's not this color at all. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just very, very vibrant. Right, that was, these are the results of my first dye session. And I am very eager to do some more experimenting. Please do let me know which color you would want me to try dyeing, uh, because I do love a challenge. So if you if you think, oh, I want to challenge you to dye this color, please let me know. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and hopefully I'll see you back for the next one. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!